and you all know what I mean by the QWERTY keyboard, right? The keyboard that starts with those letters, QWERTY, at the top, is suboptimal. It's not the best possible arrangements of letters that you can have on a keyboard if you want to go for speed. And why is that? It's because <coughs> in the old days, if you went too fast, the hammers on the, on the typewriter would jam. So at some point, they had to have a compromise, and then that kind of stuck. Okay, so an industrial production kind of stuck with this, even though it's not the best possible arrangements of letters on the keyboard. It's suboptimal. Okay? The panda's thumb is a bone structure that protrudes from the wrist of the panda for it to hold its bamboo. It's suboptimal. And why? Because at some point, the panda lost a thumb and could not regrow it in the course of evolution because that's not how evolution works. And instead of that, a suboptimal uh, substitute basically emerged um, by which the, the panda now can hold on to his bamboo while he's eating it. So the point that he's making is that, first of all, we mustn't understand natural process to be always a development of the optimal structure because that's a, a very frequent misunderstanding that people have. That um, You often hear this in documentaries. You know those documentaries that have a monster truck voice? Don't, don't trust them. Right, the, when they kind of go, and we come back and show you how horrible this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so the, uh, oftentimes, um, in these kind of documentaries, people would say things like, the tiger has this feature because it's, you know, it helps him to do this and this. So you kind of get a sense that everything that exists in nature has to have a purpose and has to be the ultimate, you know, best possible solution to a problem. This is the spirit of Stephen Jay Gould coming down to talk to us. So that's not always, that's not always the case, obviously. The point is, is that if you want to understand what's actually happening, you have to look at how the process works. You have to know that uh, in, in natural evolution, you cannot re-evolve things that have gone away. Uh, and you have to know that there is a principle called incumbency, which means that um, certain things stick just because they're there. Okay. Um, do you have a question, Katie? I, oh, no. Oh, oh sorry. It, it just looked like it. If you have any questions in, in between, you can, you can just throw them at me. Okay, so very interesting stuff, very, very elucidating. But it's not like uh, that uh, Stephen Gould actually claims that the, his, that the evolution of technology was like natural evolution. If we say the evolution of technology, evolution is a metaphor because it actually does um, work differently, right? Um, because you can actually pass down technology from one generation to another in very different ways than, than inheritance works, okay? So, in other words, A, you always have to look at everything as a process, and everything is a process, even science, and even scientific fact, and B, there are different kinds of processes. So, the world is made up of a plurality of processes, okay? And not everything's equal. This is what I learned from Stephen Jay Gould. They're really, really readable and very interesting. He talks about baseball and music and always comes back to biology. So it's, it's really a fun read that I can recommend. So at the end of his life, right, actually right after he died, um, this immense book, uh, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, was published. It's about a thousand pages thick. Um, maybe you don't want to start with that. Okay. All right, so another way of looking at the connections between the sciences and, um, and the arts, and the creative arts in particular, um, I think would be to make the connection through the nature of our minds. Right? Ultimately, that is what holds them together. These, they're both things that we do with our, through us, our being and with our minds, with our bodies and our minds. And so I just wanted to show you how this evolutionary idea also contributed to the emergence of a new idea of what consciousness is uh, toward the end of the 19th century, also thanks to Darwin. Um, in the work of William James, who's one of my heroes, okay, an American uh, psychologist and philosopher who was at Harvard, um, sort of a defined um, the scholarship uh, at Harvard in the philosophy department, department at the time and really one of the first modern uh, psychologists and philosophers of the mind. 
And the interesting thing that William James explained was that um, the mind was not just a container for facts. It's not like you know you open it up and you put stuff in it, right? It is ultimately a process. Without being able to completely show with physical experiments um, the, how the, the neurons work in the brain, which of course nowadays people have made much more progress in showing, he already had a sense that what is going on is, is some sort of like electrical neurological networking. And that uh, along those lines, the, the, the mind basically emerges from, from firings that are going on throughout the, the brain and the body. Okay? So he ultimately said that everything that we consider to be a function of the mind, like previously people said, okay, there's perception, there's reasoning, there's emotion, all these different functions of the mind, that they're all emerging from the same kind of stream of process going on in, in, the, in the body, okay? And that every distinction that we make retrospectively um, is, well, not necessarily artificial, but it's a retrospective distinction that we make when we look back at the experience. But in the experience itself, everything's just this amazing flow um, of currents, okay? And the way they work is very, in James's point of, from James's point of view, is very similar to the way in which evolution works. Namely, you all know how evolution works. You guys in the back know how evolution works? There are basically two principles. One is emergence, and the other one is selection. A phenomenon emerges, and then it goes away or it stays depending on, well, depending on what, whether it works or not, right? So there's no like, agency that comes in and says, okay, you species, you go, you can stay a little bit longer, right? It's something that comes out of the process of evolution itself. It's not something that is a separate function, okay? And so the same way that evolution works according to Darwin, once you understand Darwin properly, um, James explained that consciousness works, that um, this current emerges and um, then a selection takes place. Certain things kind of get more habitual, they kind of stay longer, they become sort of like something that's being repeated and other things are just like in the moment that they go away. And all the other functions of the mind basically form themselves in this process of emergence and selection. That was the big contribution that William James made uh, in the principles of psychology at the end of the 19th century. And I actually, just to point out to you, in case there are any retractors who say, well, you know, you can't be right, it was over 100 years ago, that this is like a very recent publication from the uh, brochure of my alma mater at Washington University, which has a very, very strong neuroscience department, that actually say that uh, basically the, who we are and what we do is in the networking in the brain, the kind of the networks that are being connected. It's exactly how William James imagined it to be, that there are these like, you know, these routes that we go, uh, and some are more habitual than others. What I'm driving at, I'm always at the wrong computer, what I'm driving at, is um, that the mind is not just something that is sort of hovering in our minds there, disconnected from everything, but is in itself a physical phenomenon. It is embodied. That's another big word in the humanities right now. It is part of the body. It is body. It is taking place as bodily function. And um, so it's in itself already part of nature, a natural process, okay? And Antonio Damasio is one of the recent neuroscientists who have formulated a lot of that for the general public. That um, actually we have sort of like, we think with our stomachs, for instance. I mean, that part of the body actually play a role in, in the way in which our mind actually works. And um, that the experience of a moment is certainly not just the kind of thought that you would retrospectively formulate, but it's much more complex than that. It's, um, it's what happens, right? particular moment. Okay, so in other words, the mind itself is, a, is uh, already like a link between the humanities and the sciences, right? The mind itself um, in the way in that it functions, even though of course the processes of consciousness are not exactly the same as the ones of, uh, that are described in quantum physics, right? It's a different process, right? There are continuities that we by the power of our imaginations and creative thought can actually recognize between them. And I just want to give you an example from um, the author that I have studied more than anybody else. Excuse the formatting, I had to type this up like, in like 30 seconds. Um, 
uh, an author who actually is trying to do something in her language that would approximate the reflection on that kind of process, the kind of process that William James first discovered the mind actually is, right? And um, the idea behind it, I mean, first when you read it, grammar is a conditional expanse, supposing there is a word that I say predicted, and include beyond that color and coloring, prepared to help it with be rapidly dispersed in as many ways that they finally do write a and a mixed implication and have cur uh, curtains faults. You kind of go like, what? <laughs> All right? I mean, it's, it's obviously, well, you would say maybe nonsense, even though she would say, I tried to write nonsense in a million different ways and I never succeeded, okay? There's always something that you can see in it. And um, so it's definitely going, let's say, instead of saying nonsense, let's say it goes against traditional conventional meaning, right? I mean, it's, it definitely goes against what we would expect from a, from a sentence or from language. So this is ultimately uh, sort of like a continued metaphor for the creative process. In the creative process, we create something that doesn't exist yet, right? So we want to create something new. And um, we go against a certain kind of resistance of the medium we're working with or the conceptions that are already in place or the ideas we already have, right? kind of want to go beyond that a little bit. And so Gertrude Stein is, is kind of going against conventional meaning in language and the, and the conventional way in which grammar works, okay? So in other words, she's going a little bit against the way in which um, these solid networks have been established in our brains and kind of wants to kind of take a different corner. You know, you get to this kind of switchboard and you kind of, okay, am I going the way that I've, that I've always done or am I going to go in a different way today, okay? So she decides, let's go in a different way today, right? Um, but it's not entirely random because she's actually also talking about the thing that she's doing. She's talking about grammar. This is from a book or from a piece called um, Arthur, a Grammar. Okay, so right there we have a little bit of a joke. How can a person be grammar, right? Grammar is some sort of like, what is grammar? Grammar is a process, right? Okay, Arthur. Arthur is a process and it's a linguistic process of some sort, okay. So grammar is a conditional expanse. In other words, grammar is something that kind of like rolls out in front of you as you're using it, and it has certain rules to it, right? It has certain rules to it, and let's see how the rules kind of work, and it's not, by the way, formatted this way on the page. It's imagine it formatted correctly. Um, supposing, there is a supposing there is a word, let us say predicted, and include beyond that color and coloring, prepared to help it with be rapidly dispersed in as many ways that they finally do relish harpoons. She's trying to kind of like open herself up to a certain amount of free influx of associations. Let the, let the language do its thing to a certain degree, but she also would like to kind of, kind of insist on playing on certain things that relate back to the topic of grammar, okay? So, um, for instance, this is ideally ever as well as they can encourage and in a fresh endeavor to be advised. This is like my attempt to um, try something new, to kind of like start over with a bit of courage to go against what people expect me to write right now because nobody will understand what I'm saying. But I am trying. This is a fresh endeavor. This is the 50th paragraph I've been writing today where I'm trying this. Okay, let's see where the language is going to take me. Okay. A grammar consists in their reminding appointment to have its effect. Okay, grammar has a certain effect. Thing is, see, as I'm talking right now, I am making sense of this. Okay, it has an, 